Lecture 34 General Custer Hero or Villain? Like the long hunter, Davy Crockett, like the outlaw, Jesse James, the Indian fighter is also a fundamental figure in the mythology of the American frontier in its attempt to convey the values of America and to speak profound truths about the American character. And the story of the Indian Wars has been a major mythological treatment from the early days of the frontier right on up until, well, the sad last end of the Indian Wars, the tragic story, and then a mythology that's been carried on by Hollywood. Of the many generals who won fame fighting against Indians, no one can come close to George Armstrong Custer. He may be the most controversial figure ever to serve in the United States Army, approached only by George Patton. And there was much in common between the two of them. But George Armstrong Custer was born to moderately uh, well-off parents. He lived his young years partly in Ohio, partly in Michigan. But you must remember that in, these, in the 1840s, this was still almost the frontier. But he grew up, he went to high school, and then for three years taught school. I like to think of Custer teaching Caesar's commentaries on warfare. And he certainly developed a abiding love of the idea of being a soldier, taking for his hero the most dashing of all of Napoleon's generals, General Murat. And in 1858, uh, he was admitted to the United States Military Academy. And when the Civil War came, their class was rushed through and he was commissioned already in the early summer of 1861 and took part in the first battle of Manassas, proving his bravery primarily as a messenger riding back under heavy Confederate fire. He soon gained a reputation as a dashing, brave leader of men. There was nothing he could not attempt and carry out. At one point uh, in the uh, campaign to capture Richmond uh, under General McClellan in 1862, a whole group of generals were standing around debating how deep the Chickahominy River was and whether they could cross it or not. And Custer just rode right out into the middle of it and said, here you are, generals, that's how deep it is. And forever thereafter, McClellan was a great supporter of his and generals like Alfred Pleasanton were supporters of his, but above all, because of his uh, prominence after the Civil War, General Philip Sheridan came to admire this bold commander of cavalry forces. And he was given command of the 1st Michigan Cavalry. And by the age of 23, he was suddenly promoted because of his gallantry in action from being a captain to being a general. And it was at the Battle of Gettysburg that Custer may have performed the greatest single service to his country. It is not always understood that General Lee's plan on that third day, that July the 3rd of 1863, was not just to attack on both flanks of the Union Army and to send in the very center of the Union Army 17,000 crack troops on a frontal assault under General Pickett, but it was also to attack the Union forces from the rear. In other words, to carry out a complete encirclement of the Union Army. Well, neither attack on the flank came off the way it should have, but Pickett's men marched bravely forward, and Lee's most Gallant cavalry general, J.E.B. Stewart, Jeb Stewart, 
led a large number of veteran uh, Confederate cavalry on a wide sweep around the Union left. And as they were coming around the Union left, they were spotted by Custer. And he had with him only his single regiment, that Michigan First Volunteer Cavalry. He was heavily outnumbered, but shouting, come on, you Wolverines, he led them himself directly into the uh, Confederate cavalry, stopped the Confederate cavalry, surprised that, that this attack by such a smaller unit, instead of pushing on through the Confederate cavalry, was backed up and finally retreated. And that was one of the keys to the victory at Gettysburg. Well, it did not go unnoticed. And he became, as the war went on, ever more famous. Famous among generals, famous among his troops, and also famous with the press. He was a dashing persona. Very gaudy uniforms, a red kerchief that his men emulated and it became their symbol. And the press celebrated him as the, one of the boldest of all the commanders. And then in 1864, he achieved undying fame, riding down the Shenandoah Valley with General Philip Sheridan. Sheridan had given the orders, I want this valley so devastated, this wheat field of the Confederacy, its bread basket, I want it so devastated that if a crow flies over it, he will have to carry rations. And that is what Custer and his men did, burning, burning houses, defeating Confederate force after Confederate force. And when the final days of the Confederacy came and Robert E. Lee was making his way with just the remnants of an army, Richmond had fallen, Petersburg had fallen, and now Lee was trying to get some 11,000 men down the road from Petersburg to Lynchburg to take trains to go down to North Carolina where he might link up with the last of the Confederate forces there under General Johnston. But halfway there at Appomattox Creek, his way was blocked and the first unit to block it was Custer's Michigan troops. And he was there as well, Custer, at the surrender. And he came out of the war famous, but now his wartime ranks were reduced. These were temporary appointments, and he came out only as a captain in the regular army. And he was disappointed by this. He thought about some business and financial opportunities. His father-in-law was a judge in Michigan, a man with considerable political influence. And uh, the wife of Custer, Elizabeth, she was beloved by him. He loved her deeply and faithfully, and she would play a major role in spreading the myth of Custer. She would live on to 1933, protecting that myth of her husband as the invincible soldier and gallant knight. So he thought about some investment opportunities that his father-in-law offered him. But what struck him even more was the offer of, offer of being a general in the army of, Juanit, of Benito Juarez, fighting against the French and against the Mex and Mexican Emperor Maximilian. And he was going to be offered $10,000 in gold to be the cavalry general of the Benito Juarez's forces. And that tempted him. It also tempted President Grant or about to become President Grant, uh, because Grant looked upon Custer as a real threat to his likelihood of being elected in 1868. So Grant approved. Grant was commander of the armies at that time. He approved the uh, request of Custer to go away for a year. But his good friends like General Sheridan said, no, you're not going to command some Mexican army. Now, you'll stay in the regular army. But Custer was still on leave of absence, and President Andrew Johnson, knowing the public fame of Custer, asked him to accompany the president on a tour through the Midwest. 
Just like Andrew Johnson, just like President Lincoln before he was assassinated, Custer believed that the South should be treated with moderation, uh, that the, the scars of the war should end as quickly as possible, and this raised a great deal of furor in Republican uh, circles. So Johnson took Custer with him and would give speeches from the train to crowds. And at one point in Ohio, the uh, crowd got so violent towards Andrew Johnson, calling him a rebel lover, that Custer said, why don't you just shut up? You know, I was born two and a half miles from here, and I never thought I'd feel so ashamed, ashamed of my fellow citizens. So he was already putting his foot into the waters of politics. But then he took back up his command and was made again a general of the 7th United States Cavalry, that glorious regiment called into being in 1866, mustered on the field at Fort Riley and with Custer as their commander. You can still today visit the house where Custer stayed with Libby, and there is nothing more evocative than to hear the tunes played at Reveille and watch the flags being raised or later in the afternoon lowered there at Fort Riley, standing right outside the house of Custer. It was a hard life out on the frontier. The Indian Wars grew ever more brutal. Now to understand what Custer did, why he did it, we must understand the policy of the United States government towards the Indians, which he was following. These were his orders. That may not be a good reason for doing something, but those were his orders and he was a soldier. And the Republican administration, more particularly after President Grant became president, had a policy of destroying the Indian culture driving them on to reservations. And it would be, in modern terms, perhaps called genocide. The war between the frontiersmen and the Indians went, as we have seen, all the way back to Jamestown. But after the Civil War, the Plains Indians were now the subject of this destructive series of wars. Now they were brave and noble warriors and they also fought, asking no quarter and giving no quarter. And just as the Creeks and Cherokees before them had attacked outlying settlements and farms, so too the Sioux. Uh, and their brothers, the Cheyenne and the Arapaho, the Kiowa, the Comanche. These were all ferocious warriors. And in 1862, during the Civil War itself, there had been an uprising of the Sioux in Minnesota. They had attacked the town of New Ulm, Minnesota. They had killed a, a number of settlers. The revolt was put down and a large number of Sioux were arrested. And finally, at the order of President Lincoln, 38 of them were hanged, the largest mass execution in United States history. In the, uh, cam in the uh, campaign of 1860, President Lincoln ran on a platform of free land and free education. And during the Civil War, despite all the uh, troubles of the war itself, the Republicans pushed through those two measures. The act establishing land-grant colleges, where the sons and daughters of farmers could go and be educated for free, and the Homestead Act, which went into effect on January the 1st, 1863. And the first homestead, you can still visit it in Nebraska today, was issued to a man with the auspicious name of David Freeman. And this meant that if you went out, settled that acreage, if you were an American citizen or intended to become one, worked it for five years, made improvements upon it, 
filed an application and filed a deed, it was yours. Well, was it really? That, after all, was the homeland of the American Indians. All the way, the land of the Kaw and the Pawnees, the land of the Osage, the land of the Arapaho, the Utes, all of this was simply given away. They fought back, fought back bravely. And none fought more bravely than the Cheyenne and Arapaho. They had fought bravely in Colorado, and they had undergone during the war itself one of the most infamous massacres in American history at Sand Creek, where the local militia had simply ridden into their camp, shooting indiscriminately men, women, and children who thought they were living in peace under the protection of the United States government. So this was the policy. And you must remember that this policy of total war had also been carried out against the South. Sherman's march to the sea, down from Atlanta to Savannah, burned and pillaged and plundered with the specific goal of breaking the civilian will to fight. And these same generals, like Sherman, like General Sheridan, were now commissioned by President Grant, to finish this Indian business. Custer, in the early fall of 1868, was sent to Fort Supply. That's in Oklahoma today. And that was going to be his supply base, under orders from General Sheridan, who wanted a winter campaign against the Native Americans particularly against the Cheyenne and Arapaho. Now, Custer's book, My Life on the Plains, is a magnificent autobiography. It is beautifully written. Some might think that his wife wrote it, I don't know, but it is a very well-written book, extremely informative, and shows this ambiguous relationship towards the American Indians. On the one hand, Custer must fight them and fight them with everything at his disposal. On the other hand, he admires them, their hardiness, their courage. But he also recognizes how utterly without mercy they are. And he describes one account from 1867, when a young officer, Lieutenant Kidder, with nine other of his troopers, rode off to bring a message to Custer. Custer had moved his camp, and in attempting to find him, he ran upon a group of Cheyenne warriors. They killed and mutilated all ten men, torturing them for hours. Custer's men finally rode out and found the remains. You couldn't recognize the faces. They were all so mutilated. And Lieutenant Kidder's father came and asked Custer, can you give me my boy's body? I can give you a body, sir, but I don't know whose it is. But I want to take it home. I want to bury it. Buried it in our cemetery. I don't know. Is there anything you can tell me special about your son? Yes. Right before he left on his last leave when he came back, he had a, a checkered hunting shirt that my wife had made for him. Was it black and white checked? Yes. I can show you your boy's body. And there it was with the tattered fragments. So that was warfare on the plains. And many a soldier kept the last two bullets for himself so that he would have two chances to kill himself rather than to fall into the hands of the Native Americans. So it was from Fort Supply in Oklahoma today, that Custer swept out on his winter campaign. He describes it brilliantly, how they marched out in a swirling snowstorm, General Sheridan standing at attention and playing their marching song. The Seventh Cavalry wearing their red kerchiefs. Custer in a frontier outfit, 
made for him by his wife of a deerskin jacket. And with them, their scouts, because the Native Americans were bitterly divided among themselves. And if the Cheyenne were going to be attacked, the Osage would be there to guide Custer. And south into Oklahoma, you can visit the battlefield today. It's a very evocative place. In the midst of a swirling snowstorm, just as the sun came up on November the 17th, Custer's men rode into a large village of Cheyenne and Arapaho. They rode in and killed indiscriminately. Accounts vary. The mythology of the numbers of warfare is a subject in its own right. Custer claimed 103 warriors were killed. Native American oral traditions say no more than 11. Custer lost, he said, 13 men. Native American oral tradition puts it higher. All agreed that he shot the ponies. They had about 800 ponies. They were the, they were the Native Americans' main means of, main, of keeping life together, of hunting the buffalo. And Custer shot them, and uh, 600 of them, and took the other 200 to carry prisoners back. And again, he describes in beautiful prose the scene of marching back to Fort Supply. Once again, General Sheridan there at attention, proud of his protege, the riding in front of them, the Osage scouts in their native war paint. Behind them, the captured Cheyenne and Arapaho Indians wearing blankets, dejected. And riding right alongside Custer and his troops as they played that Gary Owen, da 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 was old California Joe, his scout. Most of the time drunk, always with a pipe in his mouth, but he was the best man for finding Indians that Custer ever met. They called him California Joe because he wanted to get to California someday. So the battle at the Washita, or as it's now called, the massacre at the Washita. Custer's career continued, and again he got into politics. He had, just like General Patton, no sense about politics. And he had the temerity when a scandal broke about the Secretary of War and all the corruption in the Indian Bureau. And the brother-in-law of President Grant was very much uh, tainted by this charge of embezzlement and corruption. And the fact that the Indians were simply not getting the food they had been promised when they went on the reservations. Custer spoke out to the press. Custer went to Washington, took part in an investigation as a witness. And General Grant never forgave him. But once again, General Sheridan stepped in. Custer was permitted to continue in his command in the 7th Cavalry. Charges against him of insubordination were dropped. And it was there at Fort Lincoln in the Dakota Territories that he would go out on his last expedition. Custer had been sent out to the Dakotas with the 7th Cavalry. They were based at Fort Lincoln, which is near modern Bismarck, North Dakota. Beautifully reconstructed post, moving tribute to the 7th Cavalry. And gold had been discovered in the Black Hills. The Black Hills were the secret, holy ground of the Sioux Indians. That was their magic, their medicine. It was powerful. And there they buried their dead. It was their holy land where our dead lie. That is our holy ground, the Sioux tried to explain to the army. But gold, gold fever, Oh, they came from all over. And instead of protecting the sacred grounds of the Sioux, which had been solemnly promised in treaties, Custer was given the order to protect the miners. This time, the tribes realized there had to be a united resistance. Cheyenne, Arapaho, Kiowa, Sioux, they came together. Under their medicine man, Sitting Bull, they held sacred rituals, consecrating themselves to victory, to purity. They would drive the white man out. 
the buffalo would return and the land would be as their fathers had given it to them. And Sitting Bull, not so much a war chief as what we call a medicine man, a prophet, promised that he had a vision of the soldiers, the long knives, falling out of the sky and dying like grasshoppers. So a large Indian encampment, at least 2,000 warriors drawn from several tribes, armed with repeating rifles, was Custer's object. He set out. He was part of several columns being sent to capture the Sioux, take those who had fled from the reservation back to the reservation, and kill any that refused to go back to the reservation. And Custer would use the same bold tactics that he had used at the Washita. Divide his force into three columns, strike into the village, and kill as many as were necessary. They marched on. And by the 26th of June, they had reached a little river, the Little Bighorn, flowing through a grassy plain. Costa was at the head of his column, his two subordinates, Major Frederick Benteen and Major Marcus Reno, coming up behind him. He had been offered a Gatling gun, but had not taken it. It would slow him down. And he rode boldly into this village. As they began to see the size of the village, having come up on the heights looking down, his crow scouts, for the crow hated the Sioux and they scouted for the Americans, stripped off their army uniforms and put on their native dress. And they asked for time to sing their death chant. And Custer said, what do you mean? We're not coming out of this alive, I tell you. Ah, nonsense. And to the tune again of, even the bugler, as he looked down on the size of that Indian village, had trouble blowing. And Custer said, spit, boy, spit. And he blew, and they charged in. 256 troopers, soon to find themselves surrounded by more than 2,000 warriors. Some of them with bows and arrows, but most of them with repeating rifles. And the U.S. cavalry had only single shot rifles. And Custer sent a message to one of his subordinates, Marcus Reno, big village, lots of Indians, come quick. But Marcus Reno couldn't make it. He was attacked by Indians outnumbering him four to one. And he was driven back up on the heights. And Major Benteen arrived bearing the ammunition that Custer's men so desperately needed. But instead of going to Custer's aid, he hated Custer. He hated Custer for what he thought were numerous slights to him. He took up his position with Marcus Reno, and they were under attack for two full days from Indians on all sides. So Custer stood alone, and there with his troopers one by one, he fought the Indians and watched his men go down. His brave horse, Comanche, was tied behind him. Others of the troopers killed their horses, and built up like a barricade from which they could fire. But there was no competing with these Indians, with their rifles and their determination. There, towards the very end, Custer would die, shot through the head, yellow hair as the Indians called him. The big magic of riding by and touching the dead body of Custer with their acoustics. By the end of the second day, more relief troops had arrived. Reno and Benteen's troops were relieved. And 28 medals of honor were given for that engagement. And Custer? Custer would live on in fame. The Indians tried to capture his horse, Comanche, it was said. But when it fled away, they said the spirit of yellow hair lives in it. And Elizabeth, his wife, would write the touching story of how when he left, left Fort Bismarck with his men, uh, when he left Fort Lincoln with his men to go on that last expedition, 
As they started out, she had given a picnic for them, and as they started out, he suddenly wheeled his horse, rode back to where she was, saluted her with his sword, as he always did, but this time pressed into her hand an object. And as he rode out, she looked at it, and it was the golden watch she had given him for a wedding present that he had always carried. And she said, I knew he wasn't coming back. And as they played my favorite song, The Girl I Left Behind Me, I saw all those brave men. And in my mind's eye, they were not riding across the plains. They were riding up into heaven. <laughs>